Who here likes pasta? Wow, applause for pasta. I think we have basic unanimity on pasta. I love pasta too. And fortunately, I have nine plates of pasta from a local Italian restaurant. It is fantastic. Um, who would like to eat a plate of pasta while I give this talk? <laughs> yes, right here. Can you come up to the stage? Let me give you this. Uh... Here you go. Excellent. Yes, take it back to your seat. Thank you. And I only have nine plates of pasta, and I have to throw away uh, the other eight. I'm sorry. So that's uh, two, four, six. All right. So uh, one plate of pasta being eaten, eight plates of pasta in the trash. Who thinks that was a good idea? Yeah, no, but well, the one guy who's eating the pasta. Excellent. I actually heard gasps. There was applause for pasta, there was gasps for throwing pasta away, and that's right. Throwing away food is a horrible idea. And yet that's basically the relationship that all of us enter into every time we're choosing to eat meat. Because a chicken, as just one example, it takes nine calories into a chicken in the form of soy and oats and wheat and whatever the food is that's turned, you know, that is fed to the chicken, that's turned into feed and fed to the chicken. So it takes nine calories in to get one calorie back out. I'm guessing most of you, the horror you expressed at throwing away pasta, are concerned about food waste. And we should be concerned about food waste. Of every 100 calories of food that's produced, we literally throw away 40 of those calories. We throw away almost half of all of the food that's produced in the United States. And yet, food that's produced by funneling crops through chickens, it's actually 800% food waste. For every 100 calories of chicken that we produce, and chicken is the most efficient meat, for every 100 calories of chicken that we produce, we throw away 800 calories by cycling it through the chicken. That means eight times as much land, eight times as much water, eight times as much gasoline to till the crops, eight times as much pesticide and herbicide dumped onto the crops. And that's not all of it. There are also multiple extra stages of production that are required if we're going to grow crops to feed them to animals so that we can eat animals. You have to grow the crops and you ship them on a gas-guzzling, pollution-spewing vehicle to a feed mill, and you operate the feed mill and then you ship the feed on a gas-guzzling, pollution-spewing vehicle to an industrial farm, and you operate that factory farm, and then you ship the animals to the slaughterhouse, and you operate the slaughterhouse. It's multiple extra stages of gas-guzzling, pollution-spewing vehicles, and multiple extra stages of energy-intensive and polluting factories. This is not a great way to feed 9.7 billion people by 2050. Let's face it, it's a terrible way to try to feed all of those people. The United Nations, a number of years ago, they crunched the numbers on all of this inefficiency and all of this pollution. They released a more than 400-page report called Livestock's Long Shadow. And in Livestock's Long Shadow, they determined that whatever environmental issue you want to look at, from the smallest and most local to the largest and most global, the inefficiencies of animal agriculture are one of the top causes. Everything from water pollution to soil desertification to species loss to climate change. On the issue of climate change specifically, the United Nations says that more climate change is attributable to the global meat industry than to all of the planes and trains and trucks and automobiles, all forms of transport combined, almost 15 percent. On a per-calorie basis, animal agriculture, chicken, which is the least climate change-inducing meat, causes 40 times as much climate change per calorie of protein when compared to eating legumes like soy, or peas directly. So what's the solution to the problems of industrial animal agriculture? The Royal Institute of International Affairs, the foremost think tank in Europe, more commonly referred to as Chatham House, a few years back, they released a report about the climate impact of the meat industry, and their suggestion was that the governments of the world educate their citizens about the climate impact of the meat industry and encourage people to eat less meat. And the Chinese government has done just that. The Chinese government has released climate-based dietary guidelines and has said that it is their goal to cut meat consumption per capita in China in half. 
by educating their citizenry. I admire the optimism of Chatham House and the Chinese. They think they're going to educate people about the climate impact of food and everybody's going to eat less meat. But I think a more likely climate hero is Ben and Jerry's non-dairy ice cream. <laughs> I'm being facetious, sort of, but who here likes Ben and Jerry's? Yeah, I think we have uh, unanimity on Ben and Jerry's, too. It looks like as many people like Ben and Jerry's as like pasta. And if you're like everybody else, you saw Ben and Jerry's and you thought, Ben and Jerry's is delicious, right? If it were 20 bucks a pint, that would have figured in. You would have thought, Ben and Jerry's, too expensive. If it wasn't available in every grocery store, that probably would have occurred to you. You would have thought, where can I get it? And those are, in every study that's been done, those are the three factors that really dictate consumer choice, taste, price, and convenience. 100% of people in the developed world factor taste, price, and convenience into their decisions about what it is that they're going to eat. Some people figure in health, that's a somewhat distant fourth. None of you, when I flashed Ben and Jerry's up here and said, you know, do you like this? None of you thought, health food. <laughs> Half of Americans eat fast food every single week. Nobody's going to KFC because it's a health food, right? It's, it's delicious, it's convenient, and it's cheap. So how do we apply the Ben and Jerry's trifecta, price, taste, and convenience, how do we apply that to the harms of industrial animal agriculture. And in answering that question, I'm going to tell you three brief stories about three entrepreneurs who are doing precisely that. And the first one is this guy, Ethan Brown. The year is 2009, and Ethan Brown, who is this bear of a man, he looks more like a college football player than he looks like a tree-hugging environmentalist. But there Ethan is, working on clean energy, and he's learned about the environmental harm of industrial animal agriculture and he wants to do something about it. And it occurs to Ethan that meat is made of lipids, amino acids, minerals, and water. Everything in animal-based meat also exists in plants. So Ethan's brainstorm is plant-based meat. And he forms a company called Beyond Meat. He starts raising money, he starts hiring food scientists and chefs and other culinary experts. Uh, and after about three years, in 2012, he comes out with this, Beyond Meat Plant-Based Chicken. Bill Gates tries this chicken, and not only does he invest in Beyond Meat, but he writes a blog in which he says, what I just tasted was not just a clever meat substitute. What I just tasted is the future of food. So Ethan introduces a couple more products, and in 2016, his next masterpiece, the Beyond Burger. The Beyond Burger is a plant-based burger that tastes so meat-like it's actually offered in the meat case at Whole Foods, at Kroger, at Safeway, at Albertsons, at a bunch of different grocery stores. Tastes so meat-like that when Tyson Foods launched their first venture capital fund in 2016, their very first investment was in Beyond Meat. You have the largest meat producer in the United States buying in to plant-based meat. All right, story number two. Another guy named Brown. Pat Brown, Dr. Pat Brown, again, it's 2009, and Pat Brown is a tenured professor of biochemistry at Stanford University. And he is extremely concerned about what he sees as an impending climate crisis. So he has an 18-month sabbatical coming up, and he spends his entire sabbatical figuring out what he personally can do to try to stave off the climate crisis. And at the end of that 18 months, in 2011, he comes to the same conclusion that Ethan Brown came to about a year before Ethan launches the Beyond Meat Chicken. Um, he decides that plant-based meat is the way to go. As a biochemist, he knows everything in meat he can make with plants. So he raises money, and he hires scientists, and he hires culinary experts, and it takes him five years to launch the Impossible Burger. But boy, is it worth it. This thing is amazing. It's so fantastic, it's drawn investments from Li ka Sheng, the richest guy in Asia, the Facebook co-founder, Dustin Moskovitz, the, venture capital fund, the, the uh, multiple venture capital funds, Google Ventures. It's so fantastic that he actually launches this thing in shishi restaurants all over the country. And the first restaurant to offer the Impossible Bur Burger and the first chef to champion it is Momofuku and Chef David Chang. 
Some of you may remember that about a decade ago, David Chang very noisily took all vegetarian entrees off of all of his menus in all of his restaurants as sort of his personal protest against vegetarians and vegetarianism. <laughs> if, you can get Pat, if, you can, if you can get David Chang excited about a plant-based burger, you can get anybody excited about a plant-based burger. And it's certainly the case that Eric Schmidt is excited. Eric Schmidt is the former CEO of Google. He's now the chair of the board of Google's parent company, Alphabet. And Eric Schmidt, a couple years ago, he was asked to reflect on six technological innovations that he thinks will improve life for humanity by a factor of at least tenfold in the fairly near future. And he's a tech guy, so he picked mostly stuff you, you, you might have predicted. He picks 3D printers for infrastructure. He picks watches that know you're sick before you do, self-driving cars. But the first thing that Eric Schmidt talks about is plant-based meat. He sees plant-based meat as an answer to two of society's really big questions. How do we feed 9.7 billion people by 2050? And what do we do about climate change? He calls plant-based meat nerds over cattle. <laughs> All right. Our third entrepreneur is a guy named Uma Valetti. The year is 2005, and Uma Valetti is training in cardiology at the Mayo Clinic. And he's studying regenerative medicine. And he's a vegetarian, and he thinks, if we can grow human muscle tissue, why can't we grow chicken muscle tissue, or pig muscle tissue, or fish muscle, muscle tissue? Why can't we apply the principles of regenerative medicine to meat? And he ruminates on this for about 10 years, spends a lot of time studying it, a lot of time talking about it. He actually opens a lab to study this, where he's a tenured professor of cardiology at the University of Minnesota Medical Center. And in 2015, he launches the world's first clean meat company called Memphis Meats. It's called Clean Meat as a nod to clean energy. Clean energy is energy that's better for the environment. Clean meat is meat that's better for the environment. It's also just literally cleaner. Since there is no slaughterhouse, there's no bacterial contamination. And since there's no live animal, there's no antibiotics necessary, no other drugs, so no antibiotic or drug residues. And this is what clean meat production looks like at scale. Sort of your friendly neighborhood meat brewery. <laughs> so he launches this company in 2015, and within a couple of months, he has the world's first clean meat meatball. So this meatball was grown from cells, no cows harmed. And he does it for about 1% of the price of clean meat production just two years earlier. And Valetti, like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat, he attracts tech titans. Richard Branson invests, uh, Bill Gates invests, the venture capital firm DFJ, an early investor in Skype and Twitter, they invest. And then Cargill, which is one of the world's largest food conglomerates, the largest privately held company in the United States, they also invest. But it seems to me that we shouldn't be relying or shouldn't have to rely on the private sector. We shouldn't have to rely on venture capital. Plant-based meat and clean meat are the solution to some of the world's biggest problems. They're the answer, or at least part of the answer. So the US government spends $3 billion a year on agricultural research. China spends even more. Imagine if the governments of the world, if they set up clean meat and plant-based meat research centers at all of the world's great universities for tissue engineering and plant, and plant biology. We could solve these problems a heck of a lot more quickly. But of course, people like Uma Valetti and Pat Brown and Ethan Brown, they're not waiting. And you all can be a part of it, too. If you're entrepreneurial-minded, think about your next venture being a plant-based meat or a clean meat company. If you're science-minded, especially if you're interested in plant biology or tissue engineering, think about becoming the chief technology officer or senior scientist at one of these companies. If you're in high school or you're in college and you don't know what you want to do yet, think about science. Think about entrepreneurship. They are awesome. You can do a tremendous amount of good in the world and do very well for you and your soon-to-be family. But really, no matter what you bring to the table, you have the capacity to join one of these plant-based meat or these clean meat companies, which are about to be a trillion-dollar market sector. I want to explain my enthusiasm by way of a quick historical analogy. The year 
1898, there are 175,000 horses on the streets of New York City. Those horses are excreting 50,000 tons of horse manure every single month. And the streets of New York City and all of the major cities, they're covered in horse manure, they're plagued by flies, and horse carcasses are everywhere. And so 1898, again, a historical finger snap ago, the world's first urban planning conference is convened, and people from all of the great cities come to New York City, and the only item on the agenda is what do we do about all of the horse shit? <laughs> and they can't figure it out. Supposed to be a week long, after less than two days, everybody just goes home, <laughs> despondent. Ten years later, 1908, Henry Ford introduces the Model T. And within four years, there are more cars than horses on the streets of New York City, and horse-drawn carriages are relegated to the status of tourist attraction. How many people here at the end of these talks, how many people here are going to walk out of this auditorium and your primary mode of transportation is going to be horse and buggy. <laughs> no, of course not, right? That would be absurd. I am absolutely convinced that in the not-too-distant future, just like that's absurd, the idea of growing massive amounts of crops to funnel them through animals so that we can eat meat will be seen as similarly absurd. And the reason for that is that visionaries have understood that we can make meat from plants, and we can grow meat without all of the inefficiencies and without all of the pollution. In other words, food innovation in the one, on the one hand, which is competing with industrial animal agriculture on the basis of the factors that actually dictate consumer choice, price, taste, and convenience. So what you've got is you've got markets, and you've got food technology. They're going to save the world, and you can be part of it. Thank you.